Hello everybody, good evening. This is uh, iHomeschool Hangout. Tonight we're going to be talking about how to teach vocabulary for your homeschool. I am Jimmy Lanley, the co-owner of iHomeschool Network, and I'm here with my production manager, Marlene Griffith. We have a special guest, Jerry Bailey, and we have a panel of homeschool moms, and they'll be introducing themselves in just a minute. I am so glad you're spending this time with us tonight, whether you're watching live on Google+, live on YouTube, or maybe you're listening to the podcast via Stitcher or iTunes, or maybe you're just watching this YouTube video embedded on a blog post, or you're watching it on YouTube. There are so many ways to consume this content, and we're just glad to have you with us to learn about teaching vocabulary in homeschool. Our hangouts are on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, and we are more than happy to entertain your questions and comments. If you'll go over to Google+, uh, and you'll leave them on the event page, during the live event, we'll be bringing those in through the magic of uh, the comment tracker and Marlene Griffith, and we can address some of your questions right here live. And if you miss the live event, you can still leave comments. If you'll tag one of us, we will get a notification and we can respond to you. All right, we're going to shift our focus to our special guest tonight, Jerry Bailey of DynamicHomeschool.com. Jerry, would you please take a moment to introduce yourself and tell our audience what you do and where they can find you online, just a brief introduction in your background in homeschooling. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight. I am Jerry Bailey. I'm the president and CEO of Dynamic Literacy. We've been around for about 10 years, and we've been selling our products to homeschoolers for about five or six years. Uh, you can find us at dynamichomeschool.com or wordbuildonline.com, and we have a very simple mission. It is to eliminate the illiteracy problem in the United States and beyond. All right, awesome. That's great. So Marlene is my production manager. Marlene, will you introduce yourself, and then we're going to let our bloggers do the same. Hey, guys. Happy Thursday evening. Um, my name is Marlene Griffith, and you can find me blogging over at adiligentheart.com. Uh, as Jimmy said, I will be pulling in your comments from the event room, so if you have any questions for our awesome panelists, just drop them in there, and I will pull it up on the screen so they can answer your questions. Thank you, Marlene. Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon. I blog at middlewaymom.com. Um, I blog about homeschooling mainly in high school. Now we're really starting in preschool, so I've been blogging a lot more about that. And then just faith and family and everything that goes along with it. All right, Shannon, it's great to have you with us. Janine? Janine? Oh, there you go. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm Janine. I blog at TrueAmEducation.com. Um, I have three young children, so I mostly um, blog about the younger years up to about second grade. And um, I also have a curriculum site, it's BlueManorEducation.com. And um, we just blog about our life and have fun. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Yes, you have such a colorful, happy blog. Everybody needs to go check it out. All right, Brenda. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Brenda from SchoolingAMonkey.com. We also blog mainly about homeschooling. My oldest is also fairly young in third grade, so you'll get the, the young vocabulary perspective here. And um, we mostly blog about ways to have fun while homeschooling and keeping things simple at the same time. Great. Thank you, Brenda. Brenda's becoming a regular on our Hangouts. We really enjoy having her with us. All right, so let's start talking about vocabulary, ladies. We know that vocabulary is so important from preschool uh, all the way up through high school. So we can just talk about all different levels today in this Hangout. You all come with different ex uh, experience levels and, you know, as far as raising your kids and taking them through those years. So feel free to jump around when we talk about different age levels. Um, Jerry, I know that you uh, have said that English has over a million words. And that seems kind of mind-boggling. I mean, I don't think I know a million words. So what's the deal with this a million words in the English language? Uh, that's kind of interesting. You can... Find that on Google, and it's growing constantly. Um, and it's because English is what's called a dual language. 
Uh, if you go back to 1066, for you history folks, the Battle of Hastings, uh, that is when the Norman French came across the English Channel, conquered England, and actually imposed their Latinate French language on uh, the English. And the English were actually, the King of England was forbidden to speak English for 300 years in public. Uh, so the two languages mushed together. Uh, but what would happen was that parents would tell their kids, if you want to be successful, you're going to have to learn this new language. But at home, they continue to speak the old language. So it literally only took about 20 years for the two languages to mush together. And that's why there are two or three or four words for just about anything in English. And that's not the case with many other languages. So most of us don't know those million words, though, do we? I mean, do we have to know a million words? Is it important? Uh, no. <laughs> um, English is constantly evolving. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if what year it first became a verb to Google something, um, but, you know, that's certainly part of our lexicon now. So English is growing and changing constantly, but there is a, a large body of book in English that's actually based on Latin and Greek roots and 65% of all academic text that your kids are going to read starting in about sixth grade use that kind of vocabulary uh, and that you can trace all that back to the French coming across the English Channel. Okay, so you're talking about those Greek and Latin uh, roots and things. So I'm curious of the panel, how many of you ladies have taught your kids uh, Greek and Latin roots in some form? I, I know I have. How many of you have done that? Shannon, mm -hmm. are you saying? Yep. Shannon is yes? Yep. Janine, have you done that? Yeah. Brenda, have you done that? Yes. Okay, Marlene, you have too, right? Yeah, we all have. So that is a really great way of teaching vocabulary. But uh, we might want to contrast that with memorization. And I know, Jerry, I, I think that you're not a huge fan of memorization for vocabulary. So tell me what your thoughts are on memorization. And then I'd like to hear the other ladies, like how they have or haven't used memorization in terms of vocab. Okay, well, let's, let's consider if memorization actually worked perfectly. What would you get out of the deal? So the, the traditional vocabulary method is you get your 20 words on Monday and you try and memorize them and regurgitate them Friday, right? There are studies that show that by Monday, the kids that got 100 on the test can only tell you 40% of the words that were on the test. But let's, let's assume that it actually worked and they remembered all 20 of those times 36 weeks in a school year, that's 720 words a year. Boy, you're well on your way to a million. Well, maybe not. <laughs> um, that's, that's the problem with memorization. A wise person once said, memorizing leads to forgetting. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Janine, did you have some thoughts about the uh, what am I trying to say? The inadequacy of memorization when it comes to vocab. Well, um, we usually just do um, like topical studies or, um, you know, just submerse the vocabulary into what we are already doing and, and just using it a lot. So instead of flashcards and things like that, um, we, we might read a book on it and then we'll try to use it during the day, you know. And I, I, I think that with the memorization, um, you know, with the Latin still, you're kind of memorizing, but you are just doing it in smaller parts and then you're be putting it together. And another key thing that I think is really important is a lot of those vocabulary lists that, he, that Jerry was talking or um, I'm sorry, <laughs> that he was talking about, um, they're just useless. They're words that if you said them, people would just think you're crazy. You know, what is that person talking about? So um, I think that we also have to be careful for the, the, um, the content, too. 
Okay, thank you, Janine. There's a great point about we need repetition to learn vocabulary and learning it in context. And I know that we're all fans of learning vocabulary through great books and literature. So I'd love to hear the ladies' thoughts on what is the connection between reading and vocabulary. And really, it goes both ways, right? We learn vocabulary from reading, and we the more vocabulary we know, the better reader we are. So any thoughts on that? I think one thing that we've tried to do um, at home is just stop and look things up. Where my daughter went to public school through third grade and then did virtual school fourth and fifth. So it just kind of kept this idea of like you just keep moving. Like you have to finish the book by today. And if you don't finish it by today, then you're in trouble. And so she would just kind of power through it. And I feel like it created these bad habits where she would just like look over and be like, well, I guess it meant this thing, instead of really stopping and looking it up. Um, whereas now like we use IEW Fix It, and it'll give you like an underlined word, and you have to look up the definition. So I'm hoping that that gets into her routine when she's reading, like, oh, I wonder what this means, and looking it up, especially like with a Kindle, it's so easy. You just like click on it, and then you can look up the definition. Um, so just creating those habits that they can use as they're older, because they're not going to make their, themselves flashcards when they're like, you know, 23. They're going to look up things as they come across them. Excellent point. Any other thoughts on that? I have some thoughts. <laughs> One of the things that I personally love about reading and how that ties into vocabulary is that you get a lot of the words in an actual context. And that's actually how I learned most of the words that I knew growing up were in context rather than just learning them as a sort of random word. Because if you look at it as like a word that has no context, you're going to be a lot less likely to remember it. And I think that reading the words in context is also plays into knowing the, the suffixes and the prefixes, prefixes just like in the dynamic homeschool method. Because when you know what the for and aft word, uh, parts of the word mean, so to speak, you have a lot better idea of understanding along with the context of what that word is going to be without even having to look it up at all. I always thought that was one of the neatest things about reading aloud to our kids is that, you know, children can understand a book on a much higher level. If you read it aloud to them, they can understand it. Maybe they wouldn't be able to understand it if they read it solo on their own because the context and your voice and different things helps them to make reasonable guesses about what those vocabulary words mean. So it's a great way to introduce new vocabulary. So reading is so important. So I want to encourage all the moms out there to read great books to your kids and push it up beyond what they can read on their own. You know, if they're, you can read really advanced books out loud to kids and they can still get a lot out of it and they can pick up vocabulary kind of uh, indirectly through that. But, so we've talked about, I don't know if we've said the word morphology or not, but um, we know that uh, reading comprehension is the single most important skill that a student needs to be successful academically. And of course the key to reading comprehension is having a broad vocabulary. We've already talked about English having a million words, but it turns out that there's actually a system that these words are built on and that is called morphology. So I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to ask Jerry to speak a little bit more about what is morphology and why does a homeschool mom need to know that term and understand it. Okay. Um, take any word. Words are made of graphemes which are the letters, they're the shapes. They're made of phonemes which are the sounds. But what's the purpose of any word? It's to convey meaning, right? Well, morphemes are the units of meaning in words. So a word is made up of three different things. Actually, more than that, there's syllables and other things too. Um, but the, the most important part of a word is its meaning, right? Morphology is the study of units of meaning in words. And it's prefixes and roots and suffixes and a root can be a fancy Latin or Greek root but it can also be an Anglo-Saxon word that they already had over there in England before they were invaded uh, like pig um, 
words like that. Um, and what's interesting is that all prefixes and suffixes are Latin or Greek in nature, but roots are not necessarily. They can come from many different sources. Uh, but when you slap the prefix re in front of the word paint, it means exactly the same thing as it does when you slap it in front of the fancy Latin root form. Um, so morphology is all about learning those units of meaning and how those pieces fit together um, rather than focusing on, on the words themselves. It's the, the pieces of the words. So you've created a product called Word Build that's based on morphology. And if, if I understand it correctly, students learn the most common roots, prefixes, and suffixes. And so it's like they're learning the bits and pieces, and they learn what the bits and pieces mean. And then anytime you rearrange them, a kid can kind of make a really good, not really guess, but they can pretty much understand what the word means based on the meaning of the pieces. Is that the basic idea of Word Build? That, that is the idea. Our whole objective is to give kids the tools they need so that when they're reading and they come across a word they haven't seen before, they can make an educated guess about what it means because they can break it down and recognize it's part of speech because it ends with I-O-N, so it must be a noun, etc. Just a, a strange concept for a vocabulary program. We actually have words on our tests that we know we have, haven't shown to students before. And if they can answer those questions correctly, we know that they are getting it, that they're able to apply what they've learned. That's the whole point of what we're doing. OK, so I, I wanted to ask a question of all the ladies. About how much time a day would you say you spend studying vocabulary as a separate you know, subject? And I know this is going to vary because the ages of kids, it's fine. So, Brenda, how much time would you say you spend a day in homeschool on vocabulary? Well, we don't have, we don't spend specific time on vocabulary every day. Um, we probably do it about three times a week. Um, and if we come up to a word in a book that we don't understand, we'll of course look it up then. But the dedicated vocabulary time, studying how to put words together in the way similar to what Jerry was saying, we do that perhaps two or three times a week. Okay, great. Janine, what about you? We probably do a little bit every day, but it's just during our regular study time when we're going through um, our books and we come across a word, we'll look it up and things like that and um, just talk about those. I haven't done, um, you know, um, regular Latin training or anything with my kids yet, but we have talked about some of the prefixes and suffixes and things like that. So just every day, just throughout the day. So. Yeah, you integrate it in. That's fine. I'm just curious. You know, we in these hangouts, we love to show different ways of doing things. No right or wrong. It's just different options. So, Marlene, I want to ask you. I know you're my production manager, but I still want to know about you. <laughs> we actually do it daily. Um, we work on vocabulary daily. Even my my eldest. I mean, she does a lot of independent stuff now, but we work on it daily. Um, English isn't my first language, so um, I'm really picky about my kids knowing it well. Because I'll say things that don't make sense sometimes, and I want them to understand perfectly. That's like my pet peeve. I might not have to do it every day, but I do. I like to do it that way. Okay, great. Shannon, <laughs> what about you? I know you have a high schooler, and that, and I know you have a. Anyway, you talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, when my oldest was in middle school, we probably spent about 20 minutes every day on it, using like uh, Latin and Greek roots, and really talking about prefixes, suffixes, um, well, mainly the roots, and then trying to understand it in the pieces, kind of like what Jerry was talking about. Um, I don't really do much for pre I mean, she just turned four, so, like, vocabularies, this is a, well, we're beyond spoon, but this is a whisk, this is a spatula, you know, we're just kind of there. Um, but then with my high schooler now, it's probably five to ten minutes a day. I'm really hoping that she's picking stuff up as she's reading, like, right now she's reading um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Like, that comes up with a lot of words that she's never come across before. So we're just trying to put those books in front of her. And then um, she does IEW Fix It, which has vocabulary just kind of built in. So. 
And that's a good point, Shannon. At the upper levels, I think kids are getting a lot of vocabulary, uh, and really all kids do, but especially at high school, they're getting a lot of that academic vocabulary in their subjects. So they're getting science vocabulary and history vocabulary integrated in. So it's across the board for sure. But uh, I was asking about the time because, Jerry, I know that the word build online curriculum is just a few minutes a day, right? Isn't that? Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, you're going to spend anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes a day, and that's, that's it. And in fact, the activities have a timer that runs out at 15 minutes, so you can't spend more than 15 minutes. Most kids will finish long before that, but we don't want them to be unhappy with it. We want them to have fun with it, to, to like it, to want to come back. We, we kind of subscribe to the Charlotte Mason approach of, short lessons repeated often are what stick. And and that actually seems to work with just about everybody. We, we've had lots of students who are struggling. We've had very advanced students. Uh, we have a lot of students with dyslexia. And this, this segmented approach actually seems to work pretty well for everyone. So Jerry, I had a question. Is the uh, wordbuildonline.com, is that one the 5 to 15 or is it the print books at dynamichomeschool.com or are they both just the 5 to 15 minute range a day? Uh, they're both actually. It's, it's closer to 15 minutes with the print um, because there's teacher time, there's parent time uh, a little bit every day. The online, there's really no teacher time necessary and that's the, those are the ones that are time so it just depends on the particular activity but it's we don't want you to spend any more than 15 minutes and some days they'll, you'll spend five I can speak from experience my daughter used uh, one of your books and she really liked it I think she liked the fact that she was done with it really quickly and I think she really liked the puzzle aspect and where you would give her those words at the end that she hadn't seen and she had to kind of figure it out she thought that was pretty fun and and then the feedback that she was getting it right most of the time you know she could figure yeah. it out and that was really fun for her and I think that get, gave her a real confidence that she could look at unfamiliar words and try to tackle them and you know get pretty close to the meaning so I'm right. a fan of your program myself um, okay uh, Marlene bring in that question that we have from the audience okay so um, Kayleen asked she says I'm curious what age or grade you start formal vocabulary lessons we're doing vocabulary rather organically stopping to discuss words he doesn't understand in our reading or in discussion when should we switch from this to formal vocabulary study? Okay, is that for me? Go ahead, yes. Uh, second or third grade. Um, once, once they have mastered phonics, this is the next step. Remember, phonics are sounds, then morphics or morphology is, is meaning. Um, and it's, it's funny, this is actually a big difference between public school and homeschooled kids. Homeschool kids across the board seem to be ready by second grade. Public school kids are not ready until third or fourth grade usually. And we have a couple of different series. They focus on prefixes and suffixes when they first start, and then as they get a little older, then they'll get into the Latin and Greek roots when they actually need to be in those when they start seeing academic text. Uh, any other ladies on the panel like to talk about your experience with starting formal? And man, maybe you're not there yet, which is totally fine. No, no, no takers. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. I don't remember when I started with my daughter. You know, we used um, Wordly Wise. Jerry's probably not a huge fan of that program. Oh, tell me what's wrong with Wordly Wise. You know, because that was fun back in the day. Well, it's just memorization. That's all it is. And I, one of you earlier mentioned, I, I'm sorry, I forget who it was, um, that the word lists that you get are useless. Well, they really are because they're, the words themselves are not related in any way. So just as a simple example, if you're doing colors, you know, how does learning the word orange help you the first time you see the word purple if you don't already know what purple is. It doesn't help you at all. So it's just categories and lists of things to memorize and as as we said before memorizing leads to forgetting. 
Okay, so if, if you guys out there are interested in Jerry's product, I want you to go to dynamichomeschool.com. And from dynamichomeschool.com, you can find the print books. I have bought them before. They're very nice. Or you can access the online version of the course, which is called Word Build. And I was loving that he said no parent involvement in five minutes a day. That sounds like a real pro for a busy homeschool mom. Um, and Jerry has given a discount code for 25% off the print products. And you just simply use the code iHomeschool. It's all together, iHomeschool at checkout to get 25% off print. That's a pretty good discount. And uh, Jerry, when will that discount expire? A uh, long time from now. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll leave it at that. So yeah, it, it, it won't expire to... before the end of the year. All right, it won't expire before 2014. Okay, excellent. So let's talk about uh, some favorite ways to teach vocabulary. Just anything that you guys can think of, you know, hands-on, just anything. I want to hear all your great ideas. Somebody jump in there. I'll start. Um, what my daughter Kira really liked to do is she would take her vocabulary list that she had, and they were um, they were all related because they had the same root. But she had to make an advertisement on it, and it just used all the different vocabulary words. And she thought that was so fun. Like, and she would make some of the funniest advertisements because it would just be really quirky how she would um, weave everything in. But just trying to put it into use or like so one of the other suggestions was making like a quiz game um, like a Jeopardy so she would have to make the question in order for that word to be the answer um, but she really did the ad um, the ad exercise the most often because she just really enjoyed it it was a lot of fun um, one of the things that we do a lot is nature walks and I know it's really cold right now so we can't do it a lot but um, we'll go on nature walks and we'll pick things out that we see um, and maybe we'll bring like a notebook or something and record it or we'll bring a bag and um, put some things in it and bring them home and then we'll look them up and see what they are and, and just learn more about them and that's kind of one way we um, make it really exciting. It's like almost like a treasure hunt, and but we just weave vocabulary into it. And then another way we do it um, is with cooking. A lot of a lot of um, a lot of my girls they like to cook, so um, we just bring them into the kitchen and talk about the different ways that we do things. So some of the words that maybe they wouldn't um, use regularly, like simmer and um, broil and things like that. All those words that are really useful in the kitchen, um, we just learn them as we go. So learning things in context of real life experiences, that's wonderful. That's always the best way to learn anything. Love that. Great. Brenda, I know you have some ideas over there. Yes, I do. <laughs> One of uh, the favorite activities that we do with my daughter right now, she's eight and in third grade, and uh, we're probably going to start one of the those uh, official vocabulary programs <laughs> next semester. But uh, one of the favorite things that we do right now is we kind of make a game of it. We like to play like the synonym game. So when we say like an everyday word or something, so we'll be like, okay, well, what's another word that can mean that? And then it'll be my turn, and I'll have to think of another synonym, and then she'll have to think of another synonym. And so we try to figure out as many words as possible that mean basically the same thing and it's a fun game but then we're also reinforcing the existing vocabulary that she knows and expanding it some hopefully with the ones that I add in. That's really cool. I don't know if you guys have ever played the game Balderdash but uh, we've actually just played that with a dictionary uh, where you um, you look through the dictionary and you find a really interesting word that you think nobody will know and you write down the real definition and you say the word out to the the rest of the people playing and they try to come up with a fake definition because they don't really know what it is and then you read out all the definitions and you try to trick people so if you trick someone with a false definition then you get a point and that is a super fun game and I know um, there are words that I learned through playing that game that I always remember 
become goofy, you know, like the word yeg, Y-E-G-G. -G. It's actually a word, you know, and sometimes my daughter and I will still use that word with one another because we learned it through playing that crazy game. So totally silly and then in Nigeria it's not like roots or anything but it's fun and it's a great way to just enjoy you know words and have fun I know you're not anti-fun you might be anti-memorization but you're not anti-fun I am all for anything <laughs> I, I you guys you guys are great you know I, I actually observed something in a classroom one time that I you could do at home that I thought was really cool it's a more long-term thing um, this classroom made a paper chain so every time they had a new word, they wrote it on a piece of paper and then stapled it in a loop and made this chain. And they set a goal in this classroom to wrap that chain around the entire school by the end of the year. And the principal got involved and, and they did it. And they got some special prize or something. But you could do that on a smaller scale with your family and, and at home. I think that's a really neat thing because you've got a corner somewhere with this massive chain piling up and it's always there it's just a cool thing to do that is cool I love that I really do and then you when you took it down you could go through each one and kind of review and probably laugh about some funny words that you learned yeah. so you know we've talked about you know workbook kind of things and paper and pencil and we've talked about just conversing and using words in our day-to-day -day life and we've talked about um, online. So, Jerry, tell us what's the difference between the online version or the paper version, and you know which is better. What are the pros and cons for those? Uh, I don't think either one is better than the other. Uh, it depends on your situation uh, and your your home and the logistics in your home. If you have nine kids, I'd say the online is better, um, just to give yourself a break. Uh, I think I mentioned it before, the main difference between the books and the online is your involvement, the, the parent-teacher involvement. Um, it's not a whole lot with the books, but you have to do some of that with the books. You have to administer the test. You have some discussions. With the online, you don't have to be involved at all. We encourage you to be involved and to still have conversations from time to time. Um, it, so it just depends. And, you know, I... I would never go all online or all books with my kids these days. Um, of course, my kids are all 30, but um, you know, I think a balanced approach is is really good. That for every child, you do some things digitally and you do some things in print. Um, and, and I think we want to create well-rounded students. So, you know, I'm I'm partial to the online just because it's relatively new for us and I will tell you since we came out with the online in July about 70 percent of our homeschool sales have been for the online instead of instead of the books. Um, My guess is that kids especially probably you know the third fourth fifth graders think it's a lot more fun than writing in a workbook that would be my guess you know it's computer time. So so do the high school kids. <laughs> <laughs> Great yeah. point. So Jerry, let's let's talk a little bit more about that. How does it work? Because Janine gave a little comment here in the chat. She asked if it was a monthly fee, and I also wanted to know because you said nine kids, and I started thinking. So if I do have three kids that need this program, do I just pay once, and all three kids can use it, or do I have to buy three subscriptions, or how does that work financially for the online? And this is WordBuildOnline.com. <laughs> Okay, it is $25 per level per student. Each level is designed to last an entire year, just like in the books. Okay, so we have six levels. Um, so I don't remember which, which ones your kids use, but the, the element series is, is the Latin and Greek based. The content is identical, the books and the online. They're all designed to last a year, but it's not a subscription. You're actually buying access to that product for as long as you need it, whether it takes six months or two years. Uh, we, we don't cut you off until it's completed. Uh, so it's a year's worth, $25 per student per level. That is very affordable. And the, I'm thinking the pro is no book to get lost, no book to, to ship if you live abroad. or so, you know, I used to live abroad, so I always liked anything online. That is a fantastic deal. I think that's a great price for that. So you couldn't reuse it for another kid, though. 
Like no, no, okay. you can't. You can't. And and actually, you wouldn't want to uh, because we actually have adaptive technology in the program, so it keeps track of how your student is doing and automatically adjusts the level of difficulty of the content based on their performance. So if it needs to back off a little bit and make it easier, it will. When they achieve a certain level of performance, it'll bring it back up to that a higher level. Um, so it's it's personalized to each student that way. Okay. I think kids love that because they know they're not getting bogged down in, you know, something they've already mastered. They can move right along. I think that that really appeals to, to everybody. So uh, I would love to hear any other thoughts. I'm just kind of opening it up here for any of the ladies to share any thoughts about vocabulary at all. Okay. We're going to start kind of wrapping it up. So I know you guys have ideas that you didn't get to share so far. Shannon, I would really love to hear from you about um, high school. I know you do a lot of like credit by exam for your daughter, and my guess is vocabulary is pretty important to that. And I, I know you have an eye toward things like SAT and ACT. You know, vocabulary is critically important on that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts looking at the high school perspective of this. Um, we haven't done as much formal things for vocabulary. She really just enjoys it, so she just kind of soaks it in. Um, she loves spelling and vocabulary. She really likes the memorization pieces as much as um, we don't like memorization, you know, as an idea. But she likes to basically take a list and be like, I mastered that. Um, she She's not so much into, like, the arts in, you know, music. She's more um, right brain. I think that's right brained. Um, so it's just kind of picked up as things have gone along. And honestly, with SATs and ACTs, I'm still figuring my way around it. So um, <laughs> I'm hoping by my second child that we will have that figured out because we're kind of stumbling along um, trying to figure it out. <laughs> Well, I was hoping you could help me because <laughs> we're getting close to that too. Jerry, do you have thoughts about high schoolers for those big tests, college entrance? They're not technically college entrance, but you know what I mean. Well, actually, I, I can help both of you with two names that you may already know. Uh, Lee Bins is one, and Janice Campbell uh, is the other, and both of them uh, specialize more in, in middle to high school age kids, in transcripts, uh, and in, in all the kinds of issues uh, for preparing kids for college, kids who are being homeschooled for college. Um, Janice Campbell actually was one of the first people to ever review our product, and she can actually tell you how you can count it for credit. <laughs> as a high school course, you know, what what you need to do, et cetera, et cetera. So those are two people who, if I had a kid in high school, um, I, I would uh, be friends with them. Uh, so Lee Bins or Janice Campbell. Yeah, I've heard okay. a lot of Lee Bins. She, she's really on the high school market, and I will yeah. be picking up a couple of her books because I graduated high school, and I never took my SATs. I'm like, well, wasn't I supposed to do that at some point <laughs> and just nobody brought it up and it just kind of the time passed by so I'm as a parent trying to just figure it out so I know that she has some really good resources for people yeah. like me that have no clue. <laughs> okay, um, Janine ask your question for Jerry. Yes, you said about how your programs for um, second to third grade, right? I was just wondering um, if you would just put off teaching kids Latin, because I know that a lot of um, private classical um, schools, they teach Latin very young, probably in f starting in first grade. Do you just recommend waiting until they master the phonics? Yeah, actually I would. Um, and, you know, I always ask people, why, uh, why are you having your kids learn Latin? Um, and I would never discourage anyone from taking Latin, but usually the answer is to help them with their English. And if you take Latin, there's still a translation step that you have to go through to get to English. Um, that a particular Latin root may be spelled six different ways in English. And that's actually one of the things we do within our product is we present it in all of those different forms. So we kind of cut out the middleman. We present 
Latin, and we mix Greek roots in as well in the way that they look and function in English. Um, yeah, I, I actually think laying Latin on kids that early is maybe a bit much. Um, they do absorb languages like crazy, I, I know. Um, but mastering phonics, I think, really comes first. Thank you, Janine. That's an excellent question. And I have a story later I can tell you about some really snobby people at a homeschool convention who were trying to sell me a Latin curriculum. <laughs> uh, and that's not what I wanted. I wanted what Jerry had, and I bought Jerry's product. That's what I wanted. Uh, so, Brenda, what was your thought there? Um, we were talking earlier about um, alternative ways to uh, teach vocabulary, and I forgot to mention this earlier, but one of my favorite ways is... And it was actually, Shannon reminded me because she talked about her kids not wanting to do vocabulary when they're 23. But um, I think that's one of the best ways to do it actually is learn some as a parent. Like I've enjoyed uh, doing like the word of the day apps or whatever as an adult. And then expanding my own vocabulary is a great way to start introducing those words into everyday conversation, which makes them normal words for children. And I think that really helps. I remember growing up, my dad had an amazing vocabulary, and probably most of the words that I know today came because he used those words in everyday speech. So learning learning vocabulary and keeping up with it yourself, I think, is a very important step as well. Yeah, it's excellent to model that. And I would also add audiobooks uh, because, you know, we only have so much time of the day. We can't be reading to our kids all the time. But I gave my daughter tons of audiobooks because she doesn't really like to read, but she loves to listen. And so she listened to so many audiobooks, and I, and I know she picked up a lot of vocabulary that way. Uh, and even, like, the storying, you know, like Jim Hodges and Jim Weiss and all that. So, yes, audiobooks count. They do. They do. Absolutely. Okay, Marlene, you have a question from outside. Please share that. I do. Um, Kayleen is asking, um, I guess this is for Jerry, um, if there's only six levels, um, would you recommend them from second to seventh? Is there a recommended program for the higher grades? Got to hit unmute first. <laughs> okay. Um, it's six years worth of content. A lot of people started in fifth grade. Um, so we do have a lot of high schoolers who actually start it and they'll start in the second series. Um, I can honestly say if you start it in second grade and do all six levels at the end of seventh grade you could take the verbal part of the SAT and do pretty well. Um, we've talked about adding more uh, levels we have plenty of content we might do that um, but by the time you've been through that much what you're learning is a system and you'll get to a point where all you have to do is learn what a new root means and you actually know how to plug it together with all the pieces uh, in that system in English um, so uh, I don't know if we'll ever do more than six levels or not but if you're if you're coming to vocabulary in high school, you would start with that element series. There's nothing in the material that indicates age uh, at all. Uh, so I was just telling you that you could actually start it as early as second grade. Yeah, my daughter started using Jerry's program in eighth grade. So yeah, it, it's not like a set thing. Yeah, it's very flexible, which I love. I love that. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, uh, I just want to encourage everyone to check out uh, wordbuildonline.com. That is the online version of the books. And if you're more interested in print, you can go to dynamichomeschool.com and use code iHomeschool for 25% off print. Now, that doesn't work on the online thing because it's already ridiculously cheap. But the print books are 25% off if you use code iHomeschool through the end of 2014. Thank you, Jerry, for that generous discount. I think this has been wonderful uh, hangout as far as learning about the philosophy behind teaching vocabulary and some practical tips too. So I want to encourage everyone to uh, think about morphology and how important that is versus just kind of random lists of words. It's really going to make our time studying vocabulary more efficient and more productive. And I know we are all are about that. So again, thank you all for. Uh, I want to thank my panelists and my special guest Jerry Bailey. 
uh, for being with us tonight and I want to thank all the audience out there I know that lots of people will be watching this recorded and listening to the podcast and we are just so thankful for you to be part of the broad iHomeschool Network audience and we will see you guys next week at the same time Thursday night 9 p.m. Eastern bye bye everybody for now <laughs>